Welcome to the newest edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. John Schmelk with you. Today, we're joined by NFL Network analyst Bucky Brooks. But first, a reminder, you can find the Giants Huddle Podcast on the Giants Podcast Network, presented by Investors Bank at Giants.com slash podcast, the Giants mobile app, and your favorite podcast platforms. And now we're joined by Bucky Brooks. You can find him on Twitter at Bucky Brooks. He's also one of the co-hosts of the Move the Sticks podcast. If you like the draft, it is a must listen every week. And if you're near TV, he's probably on NFL Network right now talking about something. He is Bucky Brooks. Bucky, what's up, man? No, everything is good, man. No complaints. How's everything? Everything is great. Let's start here. Real basic question. We got about three weeks until the start of the draft. What is the one thing you're still trying to figure out in your own head as to what's going to happen in the top 10? Uh, What's going to happen with the Atlanta Falcons pick at four? Um, They hold all the cards because we expect three quarterbacks to go one, two, and three. Uh, are the Falcons going to take a quarterback or are they going to move out and who moves in and how does that impact the rest of the draft? And so if all of these quarterbacks go one, two, three, and even four, then that means some good players get pushed down the board. And that kind of changes how things happen in the back end of the draft. Now, Daniel Jeremiah, your co-host put out his most recent mock draft. He had nine offensive players in the first nine picks. Do you see it that way too? Potentially, yeah, because I think the only guy who has a chance, the two guys who I would say have chances to crack the top 10 maybe as defensive players, I would say Pastor Tan has a chance. And also, I I would think Michael Parsons has a chance just because of his special ability. But who's to say? I think this is an offensive-heavy draft because the marquee positions that normally would go on defense, pass rusher, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions. And cornerback, you have – Really good players. I don't know if you have that elite premier player that you would put in that Jalen Ramsey category. So that changes the narrative because if you can't get a pass rusher or a cornerback, normally you try and wait a little bit before you get a defender. Do you have anybody close to touching Sertan and Parsons in terms of top defensive players in the draft? Or is there a pretty sizable gap for you from those two guys to your next set? No, I mean, I think with Sertan, J.C. Horn would be right there with Patrick Sertan. Um, I would also think if Caleb Farley was healthy, sure. he would be in that conversation. Uh, Michael Parsons is just a difference making impact player. You don't have any marquee pass rushes that you could put in that, that blue category, but there's some linebackers, some off the ball, traditional linebackers that would kind of be like, you would get mid, mid first round or second round grades, John Davis, some of those guys, uh, Xavier Collins. So it's, it's just a different, it's a different year because I would say defensively, there's still plenty of talent. It's just not necessarily the, the crown jewels that we, nor- we normally see at the position. I know in general, the league doesn't put a ton of position value on middle linebacker. I still put in, in a lot of value on it. I think it's a really important position to have, but I want to know what that player is going to do for me on third down. And I guess that's my question for you with Parsons. What do you see as his raw on third down? Because he hasn't been a traditional cover linebacker for a long time at Penn State. He changed positions, hasn't been asked to do that a ton. And I guess you'll use him as a blitzer more. Do you see a lot of value in a linebacker that's primarily, at least to start his career, a third down blitzer rather than a guy you're going to use in a lot of coverage situations? Well, I think there's value to that. I think, one, I think sometimes in our industry we get too cute talking about value and those things. The one thing that stands out to, to me about Michael Parsons is he's a dominant player. and You feel his presence when you watch the tape. Um, his strength and power and explosiveness, particularly as a blitzer, stands up. And so on third down, if you have to blitz some more, you use him as that, it works. We saw last year in the Super Bowl, Devin White had nine, nine and a half sacks on the year as a off-the-ball linebacker blitzing. I think what good D coordinators do is they take a player and they put him in a position to be very, very successful based on the talents that they have. I would expect them to have a lot of success. You mentioned the defensive end class and the edge rusher class briefly. And I'm with you. I think it's it's a very dangerous class to dip into. How early in this draft would you be comfortable taking that first edge guy off the board? Um, a lot of it depends on what you need and which players we're talking about. I, I mean, I, I can see Jalen Phillips uh, going once we get to the teens because it matches up with what I think he is as a player and what teams are picking. The Minnesota Vikings are sitting there at 14, and that looks like a, a really good fit. Um, you know, like, depending on how people view Gregory Rousseau, we talk about the Giants. Gregory Rousseau, to me, looks a lot like 
Jason Pierre-Paul when he was coming out. And given that David Gettleman and those guys have always drafted based on traits like size, physicality, those things, I mean, I would think he'd be intriguing. This, this year, like, it's really hard because there are a couple of things that impact grades in the field that we have on what's going to happen around the league. One, you didn't have everyone play a level play field. Some guys played, some guys didn't. Some guys played a full slate of games. Other guys played three or four games. Um, we didn't have the combine, so you don't really know measurements, um, athleticism, and those things. And you don't have the group think tank that you normally have when everyone gets together. So it is really hard. I think this will be the wildest draft that we've seen in terms of the variances between how we on the outside, the media world views, what happens on the inside in terms of how the league views it. One more question at the top of the defensive class. You mentioned you had J.C. Horn very close to Patrick Sertan. Depending on which one of those guys do you like, Bucky, how much would that have to do with the type of scheme you're trying to run and how you want to utilize those guys once they're on your defense? It's all scheme dependent. Um, Pastor Tan is more complete in terms of he has more tools in his toolbox that allow him to play in any scheme. Man or zone, he will be able to kind of thrive just because his game is really refined, well-rounded. Um, he can do a lot of different things on the aisle in terms of playing from off, bailing, doing different techniques. J.C. Horn, to me, is probably as pure of a man-to-man -man cover corner that you will find. Very athletic, very strong, explosive, physical, does a great job of challenging wide receivers at the line of scrimmage. You want him to play in a situation where he can line up and just play without having to really focus on a bunch of other stuff. He has the IQ and the instincts to be able to do it, but he's such a great athlete. I want to make the game very easy for him by lining him up, locking him up, and going to play. Based on what the Giants do, which one of those guys do you think is a better fit for their scheme? Uh, I would say Patrick Sertan. Sertan is because when you think about the guys who came, they just signed Adoree Jackson. Adoree has – a high football IQ can do a bunch of different things. The one thing I do know about the Giants defense, Patrick Graham throws a lot at them because there's a bit of a snowflake feel to the game plan in terms of it always changing a lot. You have to have a lot of bandwidth to be able to process and play in a defense and play in a defense like that while still playing fast. So I think Sertan, to me, makes sense because he played in a defense that's very, very similar at Alabama. By the way, you nailed it. I talked to you after the Senior Bowls over last year, Bucky, and you said, Darnay Holmes, man, look out. Big-time slot corner. Keep an eye on him. Boom, Giants got him, and he did a real nice job for them in his rookie year. Yeah, he's a really good player. Having played with his dad, having known the kid for a long time, like I knew that he got it. And also, I don't think there's a coincidence that you're seeing the Giants bring in a lot of um, intelligent, high IQ very smart, very well-rounded guys because it takes a lot to be able to play in that defense, play on that team. And one other thing, too, they're doing, Bucky, they're bringing in a lot of guys with connections to the head coach, Joe Judge. They pick Andrew Thomas last year. You know, the Kirby yeah. Smart Alabama connections. They pick mm -hmm. uh, Xavier McKinney in the second round. Alabama, Judge Saban, you can kind of go back and forth with that. And that brings us to the offensive side of the ball. you got a couple of wide receivers coming out of Alabama. How close do you have those two guys stacked with Pitts and Chase in that group? And are they all true blue chippers for you? Uh, if you're going to throw Pitts in that, group. I think Pitts is a notch above the rest of those guys because he's such a difference maker. He's such an impact player. Um, I think with uh, the wide receivers, I think we're at a unique time with wide receivers. Like, I think these guys are really good, but I've also seen in the league that we've seen a bunch of second rounders come through and have an impact. Uh, with Jamar Chase, uh, Devonta Smith, and Jalen Waller, they all can shine and, and thrive, but I think you could also look at that next tier with Rashad Bateman, um, and some of those guys that are in that group, Elijah Moore, they may also shine. So a lot of it comes down to going to the ice cream shop and being able to pick what flavor ice cream do I want to fit in my offense and how much do you value the position? Do you value it where I need to go and get a first-round pick to be able to do it? Well, and I think that's an interesting question now because you look at the Giants, they get Kenny Galladay. He's your contested catch guy, down-the-field type guy. Slayton's your speed guy. Shepard's your change of direction slot guy. Who do you like best? I'm going to throw Chase and Pitts out, Bucky. I'm going to assume they're not making it to 11, which I think is a, is a fair guess. If they have a choice between Waddle and Smith, which guy do you think complements the receivers on their roster and fits into the stuff that Jason Garrett wants to do offensively? I would say Jalen Waddle. Jalen Waddle, one, uh, is a little thicker. Um, he also is more explosive in terms of dynamic with the ball in his hands. I'll be honest, like the Giants haven't had the same kind of juice on the outside in the passing game since Odell Beckham Jr. was traded away. And so you need to have someone who can 
uh, be a catch and run specialist, someone who can make and generate big plays. I think Jalen Waddle gives you a little more of that. As a former scout, Bucky, what's the concern with Smith's narrow 170 pound frame? Is it durability and staying healthy or is it him actually physically playing the wide receiver position successfully at that weight? Because I don't think on film you saw that really show up on tape much. No, you didn't see it show up on tape. I think it's a combination of things. I think it is the durability concerns. And then can you physically withstand the pounding on the outside? That's a huge part of uh, what you have to do. And we haven't seen guys that size really dominate the game. People are talking about Marvin Harrison, but who else beyond that has been that slender that has had a dominant career? Deshaun Jackson, but Deshaun Jackson is noticeably faster than Devonta Smith. And so that's the main concern. Still a really good player. It's just a matter of right now when we're trying to fix value and stuff like that, those things come into play. Some Giant fans, Buck, want an offensive lineman to drop to them at 11. I know you have Sewell at the top of your offensive line ranking, Slater right behind him. How close do you have Darisaw and that next group? And do you think that either Slater or Sewell could get to the Giants at 11? Um, look, I, I think this group is good. Uh, I think the main thing that you have to do is you have to figure out what do you want. I think Darisaw, Sewell, Slater, all those guys are starters. I think Jenkins and those other guys um, – are also good. So it's just trying to figure out what it is that you want to do and what you want to have at a position. All right. So if let's say the Giants have a choice, right? They can pick one of those wideouts, one of those offensive linemen. And I think it's a pretty deep class at both those positions this year, which you don't see at offensive tackle much in the draft and offensive line. If, if you're in that chair and you're making the decision, where do you think they can find the best combination in round one and round two? Is it wide receiver one, O-line two, or is it O-line one, wide receiver round two? Always take the bigs over the lows. Take the offensive lineman before you take the wide receiver because it's hard to find an offensive line. Like, that's how you want to be able to do it. And when you try to set up Daniel Jones this year, is it more important, you think, to get that extra weapon or is it more important to get that big old lineman? Uh, I think you want to make sure you protect him. You want to get weapons, but you can find weapons at other rounds. And so you just want to make sure that he's protected, that he doesn't feel the pressure because pressure makes him change. All right, Bucky, final question. Ideal fit for you where value meets availability. Who would be for you the, the best possible Giants pick at 11th overall in the draft? Well, I mean, if he gets there, like any of those offensive linemen, Rashawn Slater would be a great pick. I think Elijah Vera Tucker would be a great pick. Um, we could take a wide receiver there, but uh, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, those are there. I think a lot of it depends on how it shakes at the beginning part of the round, the, be the first part of it. Well, it should be fun to see it all play out. Bucky, we really appreciate the time. Best of luck the next three weeks down the home stretch here. We'll enjoy watching NFL Network, and we'll catch up to you soon. All right, man. Appreciate it. That's Bucky Brooks, analyst for NFL Network. Again, you can find him on Twitter at Bucky Brooks and the co-host of the Move the Sticks podcast with Daniel Jeremiah. You can also see him on a bunch of other programs on NFL Network throughout the day and evenings. He does his mock drafts. Um, he's on Path to the Draft. You name it. He's part of their program and covering the NFL Draft. For Bucky Brooks, I'm John Schmelke. Thank you for joining us on the Giants Huddle Podcast, which is part of the Giants Podcast Network, presented by Investors Bank, which you can find at Giants.com slash podcast, the Giants mobile app, and your favorite podcast platforms. For Bucky, I'm Schmelke. We'll see you next time, everybody. Stay safe out there.